this is the session on the uh, managing security resources in Africa. And I just want to put it in perspective, this is the end of the, uh, our second module. And our second module is about catalyzing strategic solutions. And I think we have started very well the role of the strategic leadership and how can we forge a new civil military relation to address the security threat facing Africa? And also, how can we enhance professionalism as a key component for African leaders to equip themselves to address security threats? And we discussed yesterday the importance of the national security strategy to provide the guidance and a vision for the African leaders to address the security threats. We are now going to the real heart of the challenge. How can African leaders in security sector behave in terms of resource management? And that's a very key component of the leadership. And before I start, let me ask some of you, how many of you have seen the approved budget of your countries, particularly the military spending? If you can raise your hand. How many of you have you seen the budget, approved budget of your country? And looking to the military spending, raise your hand, please. You are your, I cannot see your hand. <laughs> okay. What am I seeing? What am I seeing? I'm seeing we, the security sector leaders, budget is a key. Budget is a very critical. Budget is about the government. Budget is about the behavior of the government. And as leaders, it is extremely important for you to look into this important document to guide you. Then based on that question, how many of you believe that the military spending in your country to be increased, the military spending to be increased? If, you, if yes, raise your hand. Do you think the military spending in your country to be increased? Okay. And who think that the military spending should be reduced? Can you raise your hand? Who is undecided? <laughs> okay. I'm asking this question, keep them with you. I will ask the same question at the end of the session. <laughs> so let me, let me start first about the budget and the military expenditure. Although I don't want to preempt the contribution and the, of the panelists, but I just want to highlight some few points. Budget is a law. Budget is a test of how the government will walk the talk. You have policies, you have strategies, but all these things are only reflected in the way that you want to use the resources. On the continent and indeed around the world, there is unconstrained military spending, unconstrained military spending. Every year military spending is increasing. It's not only in Africa, but globally. Surprisingly, even during the pandemic of COVID-19, military spending is start increasing why the health, the spending in health declining is a paradox. Not only this, what is even very alarming is that while there's a very increase in the military spending on the continent, and security sector expenditure generally, the health, I mean, the indicators related to safety and security is started deteriorating in terms of criminality, in terms of the safety, and in terms of even national security. So there's a mismatch between increased military spending and the security outcomes. And this is this mismatch 
raising a lot of questions of what can we do differently. So this session today, you would like to achieve a specific objective, we hope by the end of this session. One, we, we, we will be able to see, to share with you the trends and the drivers of security military expenditure in Africa. So what is the trend? And what are the drivers behind the military expenditure in, in Africa? And when we talk about military expenditure, military expenditure is a proxy for the security spending. And second, we plan, we'll examine the core budgeting approaches and principles because these are key for us to understand the way we manage security resources and considering how they can guide the planning allocation and alignment of security resources through national security strategy. And the fourth to share challenges of introducing and implementing the principle of public expenditure management and resource mobilization in the security sector, particularly as they relate to off budget revenues and expenditure military business, uh, that the military becoming engaged in business, and also the payroll, and the issue of procurement. And last, what is expected from the, the security leaders in managing better the security resources uh, in Africa? So this is how we, we would like to, these are the objectives we want to achieve to ourselves by the end of the, uh, of this session. And I want to, uh, I want you to know with this session, there will be some jargons, economic jargons, and I want you to keep yourself. Don't be shy from these jargons. We like to make sure that these jargon to be simplified for you to understand. But importantly, we like you to be an economist uh, because as a leader, you need really to know this jargon in economics. And uh, so in order to start this debate and discussion, we have two outstanding uh, seasoned economists who will be helping us to, through this, uh, this, 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 this session. They are friends, economists, and we have been together with them on a very important program that we are running in the Africa Center called Managing Security Resources in Africa. And of late, what we have done, we have linked the national security strategy as a program and the managing security resource in Africa. What is the link between two? And I think they will be able to, to, to help us to go through this program. So I will start with a friend of mine and, and uh, a leading economist, a seasoned economist, uh, 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 Dr. Gary Milante. He is, some of you might have heard the, uh, the, uh, the piece, the, the CIPRI, that is the Swedish International uh, Peace Research Institute. Uh, which is a very leading uh, organization focusing on issues to do with the military expenditure. So they have all the information about the military expenditure. And in fact, indeed, there's a commitment by member states to avail all the military expenditure because it's a United Nations commitment. So CIPRI has been doing a great job in, in, uh, in analyzing the military expenditure, global, but importantly, focusing on Africa. So. So Dr. Gary is the director of, uh, of the CIPRI Peace and, and Development uh, Program. Uh, and, uh, and his focus is on the intersection of security and socioeconomic development. And uh, Dr. Milante has concentrated on making the complex problem associated uh, with sequencing of institutional reforms, uh, development portfolio design, strategic planning and needs assessment that could be easily accessible to the policymakers and practitioners in this field. Uh, and he's having a special focus on the fragile and conflict affected uh, uh, countries. So it will bring in a very a lot of wealth of, of, of knowledge and especially focusing on the military expenditure. And far to my left, uh, uh, a great friend as well, uh, Dr. Willine Johnson, uh, uh, I could say is one of very, outstanding and seasoned economies that I have come to know. And she's, she's always becoming our sounding board whenever we are developing our, our, our program in the Africa Center. 
So she served as a consultant advising institutions, national government, and international organizations on issues related to finance and development. And her current assignment focuses on peace building and strengthening capacity in the security sector of African countries. Dr. Johnson was previously the US Executive Director at the African Development Bank and a member of the United Nations Committee for Development Policy and also a co-chair uh, of the African Regional Committee of uh, Grameen uh, Foundation and a chair of Sub Af Sub-Saharan Africa Advisory Committee of the United States Export Import Bank. Dr. Johnson served as an adjunct faculty at the United States Institute of Peace and Columbia and Cornell University. And recently, uh, she served as a member of the Board of Trustee of Tuskegee uh, University. Tuskegee University is one of the very early university in the South in, in uh, uh, focusing on the, on the especially African-American and uh, one of the people visiting this, this great university. And she holds uh, degrees in social studies from Harvard University and African study from uh, San Diego University, as well as a doctorate in uh, development economics from Columbia University. You know, Columbia University is one of the very outstanding, very great uh, universities, especially in economics. And in recognition of her expertise in governance and public administration, Dr. Johnson has recently been elected as a fellow of the National Academy of Public Administration. Please welcome them and great to having them. Now let us spark our discussion. Uh, first, I would like really um, Dr. Gary to, to start the, the uh, the, uh, the discussion. And the way I would like, uh, based on his personal experience with, uh, with CIPRI, that is the Sweden International Peace Research Institute, that is focusing on the military expenditure, I would like him really to share with us the way he, he reviews the trends and pattern of military expenditure in Africa, particularly during the COVID-19. And uh, is really military spending uh, 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 increasing excessively and uh, in relative terms and possibly to compare it to other global trends it's not only africa africa in relation to other to other to other sub region and is it really making military spending there's a lot of debate should military spending be classified public make it public will it help if it is made public in delivering security, and which countries, and there's no offense here, which countries have been increasing the military spending, and which countries have been reducing military spending, at least for you to see those facts if you cannot see it from your budget. And the second really to see, uh, although there's some variation in the military spending on the continent, uh, is it possible that we can, what are the main drivers, the common main drivers of the military spending, unconstrained military spending in Africa? Cognizant of the fact that there's a variation in, on the continent. Um, and is there a justification for such a, uh, this, for such a spending? Because in terms of opportunity costs, an opportunity cost, if we were to invest the same amount of money, in another service, it, will it have any added value? And the last is really, and just definitely how to overcome some of these drivers. And, uh, and the last one, maybe we need also to conclude with some positive notes. Uh, what are some of the best practices uh, in efficient alignment and use of military spending? Uh, and that could be a good share with us some of the example. And what is expected from the military security sector leaders like you in order to be involved in how best you align the national security strategy with resource management? And, uh, uh, and how can this military spending will be able to deliver better citizen security and safety on the continent? So these are some of the things, that's, this is how we would like to start first with uh, Dr. Gary. Maybe I will 
shift later on uh, to Willene, Dr. Willene Johnson to about what is expected from her. So you are welcome, Dr. Gary. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Duter. Good morning. I'm always happy to be the op opening act for Dr. William Johnson. She's uh, a star in our circles. Uh, and so, uh, and, uh, and thank you for the kind introduction, Dr. Luca. Um, so we're economists that may be foreign to you. Uh, what do economists do? We study the efficient allocation of scarce resources. Five words, that's it. Efficient allocation of scarce resources. And what are the two most important words in there? You might think it's resources, like that's what everybody's concerned about. You might think it's allocation. There's something about justice. There's something about how we perceive how the pie is split. But I think the two most important words are efficient and scarce, mm -hmm. right? Scarce, we know that we have limited budgets. We know that money is not infinite. And, and money has to be used in some way. And that's what uh, Dr. Luca was talking about. Every year, we have to have a budget, allocations. We have to figure out how that money is going to be spent. And efficient is part of the reason we do this. What is the best return on that money and how it's being spent? And so I really like those two descriptors that are in there because that's what drives a lot of what we can do. And a pie can be divided any number of ways, but the rationale for how it's divided and how it's going to be used, that's what's really going to determine success or failure in a, in a country. Um, and so what I will talk a little bit about today is trends in military expenditure and put that into perspective with the larger budget as well uh, of the country. So what are the trends in military expenditure? Um, in most countries in the world, the military expenditure has been increasing over the last five years or so, particularly in 2019, 2020, and in 2021, and again last year. Um, actually, Africa is a particularly kind of volatile uh, military expenditure region. So if we're going to lump all the countries together, and obviously there's great diversity of countries, but if we were to put them all together and then figure out for the region, um, it only accounts for a, a little bit less than 2%, let's say 2% of global military expenditure. Um, however, there is quite a bit of volatility. Countries can increase or decrease in any particular year. Um, and that's partly because the military expenditures are not particularly high. However, they're very high in relation to the government budget, right? And this is where we get back to efficient and scarce. The government budgets are not large. And some, uh, and, and many African countries have military expenditure that's over 10 or 12 or 15%. Some go as high as 25%. And there are a couple, I won't name names, but there are a couple that go up to 50%. And so these are extraordinarily high amounts of military expenditure as a proportion of the government expenditure. And there's all kinds of reasons for that. And you can come up with all kinds of reasons. And this is what part of governance is, is uh, people in cabinets or ministers getting together with their ministry of finance and saying, this is what we need. These are what our strategic priorities are, coming up with a strategic plan, saying this is what our risks are, this is what our threats are. This is how we need to spend this money, and this is what our costs will be for that. And some of those might be good reasons. I'm, I can't tell you which are good reasons and which are not good reasons. That's for you within your government to decide, right? So I can't come and tell you, well, your percentage should be this number or your amount of spending should be this. How, and for example, Uganda was uh, fighting the ADF for a couple of years. Their military expenditure increased during that exact period. Interestingly, Uganda's military expenditure decreased this last year as they've kind of scaled back the operations. Um, Kenya, same thing. It was fighting Al-Shabaab for many years. And this last year, military expenditure has decreased again. And so in some ways, that volatility reflects flexibility. It reflects 
saying, okay, well, look, um, we actually have these kind of risks. These are the challenges we're responding to. And so we're now changing and adjusting our budget. And that's, that might be good. In other places, that volatility reflects uh, corruption, uh, absorption or disappearance of funds. Uh, it could reflect you know, mismanagement of budgets or procurement or other things, right? And so, again, I can't tell you, I can only tell you the numbers as they are uh, for the entire country. Um, but that raises the question about looking at the right level of military expenditure. If I were you and I was looking at the level of military expenditure and I was answering the question, should it be increasing or decreasing? Should it be, stay the same? I wouldn't just think about what it currently is, what military expenditure is currently being used for and what risks and threats you're responding to. Uh, the Minister of Finance and the, the executive leadership also has to balance how those funds can be used elsewhere. And I think Dr. Johnson will speak more about opportunity cost, et cetera. Um, but we can also talk about that during question and answer. However, they also have to consider, and this is one of the tricky parts about economics, they also have to think about the value of the money in the future. Mm -hmm. And what is what most countries, including my own, uh, grapple with is borrowing money today to be able to finance expenditures today, right? And so you can walk, sometimes when you're walking around in DC here, you can see our national debt on a little marker that's kind of rolling up all the time, right? $30 trillion, 30 trillion with a T dollars. And we are the largest military expenditure in the world, right? So we are making a decision about our expenditures today and the value of that for, against the debt that we're accumulating for that. There are some countries though that have a higher debt to GDP ratio than the United States. Many countries have a higher debt to GDP ratio than the United States. And many in Africa are financing militaries today with debt that they're accumulating for the future. I've expanded the word GDP. Uh, sorry. GDP, gross domestic product, right? So that's the total production of the, of the country in a year. It's how much output there is. And it's a, a way for us to tell how, how big the pie is, right? That's going to be split. So those are things that I would think about. Um, I think there are some countries that have high enough debt to GDP ratio as a percentage of GDP that I would you know, I would think twice about borrowing. Um, who are some of the countries where military expenditure has increased? Uh, Benin, uh, just in the last year, Benin, Nigeria, Senegal. Mozambique has this kind of mixed story that's going on there uh, in a variety of ways. And we can talk more about that later. Um, but then there are other countries, for example, that have extremely high levels of debt. So Eritrea, uh, Algeria, Cape Verde, uh, Mozambique again, Zambia. If, and th that doesn't necessarily mean that you know, it's unsustainable. It's just that the debt is telling you about what people's expectations of the future are, right? And that it's worth investing now in military expenditure. So then the question is, what is the right level there? So a very quick exercise then I would like us to do. I would like you all to write down on a piece of paper, and we're not going to share this. I'm not going to ask anybody for your, so there's no right answers, just what you think right now is your military expenditure. Either you could say it in local currency, you could say it in dollars, or you could say it in percentage of GDP, or you could say it in percentage of government expenditure, so as a percentage of the budget. So you could just pick a number. Decide which of those you would like to describe it in. Everybody just write it down very quickly. I'll give you a second. So you could just write down one number, either what you think uh, your kind of military expenditure is uh, in your local currency, in dollars, or in as a percentage of GDP or as a percentage of government expenditure. 
Okay, just a number, just your sense of how much it is. All right, now here's the exercise, okay? That was not the exercise, that was the setup for the exercise. Now, the exercise. So uh, where there's four tables there, you're gonna be one section, and then the middle section here, you're gonna be section two, and then this section over here, you're gonna be section three, okay? So this section over here, let's say that you have a contraction next year and your GDP is dropping. What do you think ought to happen to that number you've written down? Decide whether it should go up, down, or stay the same. If, you're, if your economy is gonna be shrinking next year, you know that there's gonna be a shock. There's supply chain shocks everywhere, right? So you know there's interruptions. In the middle, let's say that your economy is stable. It's just gonna stay the same. What should happen to your military expenditure? Should it go up? stay the same or go down. And over here, you're going to have a boon next year. Your, your economy is doing well and you've got all kinds of things going on. So there's going to be surplus next year. Should your military expenditure go up, stay the same or go down? All right. Everybody's decided. You get where we're going? All right. Now we'll revisit the question again, but this is a, not a should. This is a what do you think will happen? Who thinks their economy, the military expenditure will go up next year based off of your scenario? All right, a bunch of people here think it will go up next year because of their scenario. You kind of expected that one, right? Who thinks it'll stay the same based off of the scenario you're in? Okay, who thinks it'll go down next year based off of the scenario you're in? Perfect, that's exactly the result I was going for. And this is the reason why, is military expenditure is very sticky. And lots of government expenditures are very sticky. But what happens is they get put into the system as part of the budget. And then, you know, I'm, I'll, I'll characterize it a little bit, but the conversation goes something like this. The Minister of Finance calls in the Minister of Defense. The Minister of Finance says, how much do you need next year? The Minister of Defense says, do you like how safe and secure you are right now? And the Minister of Finance says, yes, we like how safe and secure we are right now, or we would like to be more safe and secure. And the Minister of Defense, okay, okay, I need at least that much money or more money, right? That's a very, very oversimplification. But very rarely does it go down, even when we have plenty and we might be you know, changing our allocation of resources or we might, that plenty could be associated with peace. We're very peaceful now. And so maybe we don't need as much military expenditure. And very rarely does, even when we have these kind of shocks that we know we're expecting, is military the one that takes the shock, right? Very rare, rarely does it change. And why does that happen? Because of what we spend money on in the military. So we have these, I, I break it down into three groups, sections, if you will. Labor, just three areas. So we keep it simple. Labor, capital, that includes equipment and weapon systems and logistics. So I'll repeat those again, just so that everybody has it. If you want to break down your budget and you want to understand it at the simplest level, three types of things that you're paying for labor. That's all of your staffing, all of your military personnel, all of your salaries and payroll equipment, that's your weapon systems and your machines and your vehicles and all the things that you need to be able to make those things happen. And then logistics, the things to be able to put those things, move them around to training, to mobilization, all the other stuff that you have, right? Food, fuel. The cost of equipment, what's interesting about that is that the cost of equipment often is borne over the life period of the equipment. So you might get very cheap equipment, you might pay very little for it in a particular year, but then pay a lot for it over the duration of the equipment because of these kind of recurrent costs with maintenance, training, upkeep, et cetera. So those logistics costs can be quite high. Um, sorry, the cost of equipment can be quite high, but buried in the future, right? So you, you're committed now to doing that. And that's what I meant by military expenditure can be sticky. You're often then having to invest in systems and then say, well, now I need to keep up and maintain these systems. And so then that has those costs. Um, 
And then, of course, and when we're comparing military expenditure, we have to remember that not all militaries are organized the same way. Some have navies at the simplest level. Some have navies, some don't. Uh, some are responding to different types of threats. But at other levels, they are organized differently. So they may have private businesses or private sectors in, that are incorporated into the military. The military does certain functions. And so comparing those across countries can be difficult as well. In that particular case, a, 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 I do have a recommendation. I very rarely say you ought to do a thing. I usually say, this is what other people do. Have you thought about this, right? But if there are private sectors in the military, there really needs to be a thorough kind of exploration of why they're in the military. To what end? What, what purpose are they serving to be part of the military? Because in, the, in many cases, they're not competitive. So you have a non-competitive private sector, right? They can, they can be cheaper than other actors. They're delivering services maybe that you might have private sector coming in to do. And so, uh, and as a result, there can also be an opportunities for, for corruption or for resources that are misplaced or for a lack of accountability for the military to the civilian government. Because once you start collecting your own resources and you're self-sustained, you don't have to go to the Minister of Finance and tell them how much you need, then, the, then there's very little incentive for you to, to play by the rules, right? And so that's really a place where, and I think you'll talk more about uh, transparency and, and budgets. Uh, that's really a place where I think you ought to unpack it if you're really doing a, a proper public expenditure review of your military and, and what is the purpose of it? What is, what is it doing? And then lastly, I'll just say that um, all of the data that I've, that I've quoted and I have here, and I'm happy to discuss over coffee break and I'll stay as long as there are questions, uh, uh, all of the data is available on CIPRI.org and it's under military expenditure. There's also a lot of data on arms transfer there and other interesting things, but CIPRI.org, S-I-P-R-I.org. And you can look up your country and you can say, oh, this is, this is what our expenditure is. It has it in local currency. It has it in US dollars. It has a percentage of GDP as a percentage of government expenditure. So you can be able to look on there and compare yourself to another country, et cetera. However, and we, we make that data publicly available. It's a, it's a public service of CIPRI. And so anybody can go on there and get it. Uh, it's the, you don't have to subscribe or anything like that. However, it, that's, we've been doing that for 40, uh, almost 50 years now. And the reason it, it, it's still difficult is because so few countries publicly disclose uh, their, their data. And so we have researchers that will go into every individual document put out by the Ministry of Defense to be able to tabulate and figure out, in some cases, estimate, we think this is what the expenditure is. But um, there are moves by, for example, uh, UN MILEX and UN SCAR. Um, I don't remember what those acronyms are, I'm sorry, but they're UN uh, systems that work with uh, member countries to be able to promote transparency on, and reporting on, on budgets. And I encourage you, if you're encountered by the, if you encounter those UN agencies, please work with them. We need the data to be able to be able to put that together, that data for you and your citizens need that data. And you as citizens need that data to be able to monitor the expenditure of, of your government on military. So uh, we could talk much more about this and I'm sure there will be many questions and that's why I will stop talking there. And I thank you very much for your attention. Well, uh, thank you very much, Gary. I believe some of us might have picked some of the terms um, of uh, economics, but I think two things I want to highlight what he said uh, is scarcity and then efficiency because these are very, very important. And uh, the second, what is very clear is that military expenditure, even your equipment, even the size of your army, is a pub in the public domain. If you don't give it to your citizen, 
that are available in the public domains. So it's not better that you share this information with your citizen rather than say it's classified, in fact, they aren't classified. They are available. And this is a very important issue of transparency and engaging with citizen, availing the citizen with the information about the military expenditure. So one thing that Gary is saying is that your military expenditure is available. It is true, it's a commitment. Some countries are not availing these military information to the year, to the year, to the year, UN. And the idea of the UN of the UN of declaring your military expenditure is to allay the fears that you are not in any way becoming a threat. And that is the commitment of the member state to, to make sure that the military expenditure is made public to allay the fees of the year. Please, I just want to go with these two things, and especially the transparency in the military expenditure is not secret. It's not classified. You may classify it at your level, but it's not, it's not, it's, it's available. So let me move now the debate to the, uh, to the, to another level, especially now, this is the train, the drivers, the dynamics of how you can be able to allocate these, uh, these resources. And, uh, and we are focusing only on the military expenditure, but it's an indication, a proxy for the rest of the. I want really, um, um, uh, Dr. Johnson to really move the debate now to the, to the actual budget, uh, because she's having a very wealth of experience, as I mentioned. We really would like her to share in a simple terms, and in a, a non-expert in this field of economics, the budget process. Because I can see when I ask you the level of our knowledge about the year, uh, the year uh, is very, it's very, it's very, it's very low. So, and how it is linked to the allocation and alignment of security resources. In, in other words, what are the critical elements in the budget that we must pay attention to in terms of resource allocation? And the second question really is just to share with us the budget principle and approaches. Uh, and, 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 and if you can share the challenges of applying this budget principle and approaches in the security sector, and how can we be able to overcome these challenges? And the last is the link between national security strategy and the budgeting process, and including why do you think an inclusive national security strategy will be able to manage better this, the budget and deliver better the security and safety to the citizen. And what we expected from the role of the security leaders like the participant to do in managing better the security resources. So Dr. Johnson, you are welcome. Thank you very much and good morning to everyone. I would, of course, like to express my gratitude to Dr. Luca and to the Africa Center for inviting me to speak here this morning. But I think I have to be especially grateful that you have placed this discussion immediately following your discussion of the national security strategies and just before your discussion of the regional organizations, because I think that it's absolutely essential when we assess whether a country should spend more or less, that we think of it within the context of the entire national budget and within the context of the national security strategy. And so efficiency is very important, but effectiveness is important also. So not only do you get the value for what you're spending, but you're spending on the right thing. Uh, I remember once, this was 50 years ago, I was in Nairobi and I was looking for, um, I was going to go to Mombasa and I wanted to buy a bathing suit. And I walked into a store and I said, do you have women's bathing suits? And the, the man in the store said, no, but I have very good shirts. And 
So I was, of course, not interested in buying a shirt. But unfortunately, many of us, when we go to the market for military equipment and other things, we may be vulnerable to the sales pitch of someone who's selling a very complex and expensive fighter jet or some other um, equipment. Yet it does not meet the needs of the country. It does not meet the national security strategy. And when you walk into the world of per procurement for military, you must walk in with that guide of your own objectives, your own national security strategy. It may be good for someone else, but it's no good for you until, um, until you can use what you need when you need it. May I have the first slide, please? You have a wonderful syllabus. And I think that I will be reading uh, the articles and the books from your syllabus for the next few months. And I hope you will also. There are several organizations that are mentioned in your syllabus. One of them is the Mo Ibrahim Foundation. Another is the World Bank that recently produced Securing Development. Another is the International Budget Partnership. Now, some of the articles from the International Budget Partnership came out just in the last few months. And so I have sent them to Dr. Joa and he will share them with you. But these organizations are civil society organizations that consider very important issues that relate to governance. And by governance, I mean the whole set of how a country is run. And governance must begin with the laws. It begins with the law and the practice that conforms with the legal environment of your country. And so even though we are economists and we're talking about economics, we actually have a lawyer. I I'm looking at a lawyer there, but we have lawyers at our side when we do all of this, because the budget law is a law of the land. And everything that is done related to the budget must conform with that. Now, the Mo Ibrahim Foundation, as many of you know, was founded by an African who was very concerned. He was an enormously successful businessman, but he understood that for business to succeed, countries must be governed well. And each year that foundation studies different aspects of governance. Now, they're not focusing only on the security sector, they're looking at the entire government. And in the last few years, the index of governance has been improving in Africa. African countries have been uh, growing economically. They've been managing their affairs, their fiscal affairs in a, in a better way. And they've been taking advantage of the fact that investments in education have provided great universities on the content. But when the index looked at African governance, what they found was that security and safety were declining. That is, Africans were not feeling safe. They defined security and safety as being freedom from conflict, freedom from human trafficking, freedom from displacement suddenly we were seeing these elements develop in the continent after a period of some peace. And so I think all of us will admit that 
security and safety is a major goal of your national security strategy. And Dr. Cole and Dr. Joel have written a paper that has described how conflict in Africa has changed and the threats in Africa have changed. But what we've seen and what you saw last week is that you have even newer threats that are emerging. I think that Dr. Cole and Dr. Joel uh, spoke about intra-state conflict, civil wars, fights within your country. They spoke about transnational crime. But I understand that last week you considered other new threats, which would include cyber threats, which would include the impact of climate change that might lead to catastrophes. So there are new threats that countries are facing. Uh, but I think that one of the threats that we are facing that we can manage well, because you can't manage or avoid all threats, but one we can manage well is the threat of poor financial management. Now, if you look at the next slide, you'll see that, well, it may be hard to see, but you can see from the colors. Um, what the slide is looking at is public administration. So even though economic conditions were better in some countries, the role of the tax authorities, the um, fiscal management, and in particular, budgeting and procurement, if you look at that red section at the bottom, those aspects of public administration were actually deteriorating in both the last five years and the longer term trend of, of 10 years. And so countries, even though there were more educated uh, administrators or people who could be administrators, um, there were think tanks, there's all these possibilities, but the focus was not on the budget and on the security sector budget. Now, if you go to the next slide, you'll see that the security sector budget must fit within the entire national budget. And uh, Dr. Malante was at the World Bank for some time, and I worked there many years ago. The World Bank avoided anything to do with conflict. They avoided anything to do with the security sector. And slowly but surely, they came to understand that security and development are closely intertwined in a very complex set of relationships. And so it's impossible to have development without peace. And it's impossible to have peace without development. And so that's what we're going to tackle today. And when you look at the security and development book that actually you've been given access to because it is hundreds of pages long, you'll see that on page 25 and 26, this is the little section that uh, we are looking at today. They list three factors that lead to problems in security sector budgets. The first problem is that the security sector is not treated as an integral part of the national budget. Secondly, that the key actors are so worried about secrecy and confidentiality that they actually block access to the documents, to the plans. And so you don't have the, the participation of the citizens and other informed experts in the budget process. And the last very important challenge is that the audit and oversight bodies 
have not been transformed in a way that is consistent with protecting the confidentiality. You can't really use an external auditor to come in and look at your military operations. You must devise a way of building the capacity of the internal audit and having the reporting structure done in a way that the internal audit maintains independence and has the capacity to do the job. And perhaps most important, and we're fortunate today to have several members of your faculty who were ministers, they can tell you that the parliament has an extraordinarily important role in oversight of the budget, but also of the military budget. Again, this means you must have legal procedures, protocols in place to handle confidential information. And you also have to have protocols in place to maintain scrutiny over the individuals who have the access to confidential information. And so every year I had to report all of my assets, um, even my automobiles, any bank accounts, others, because that was monitored because I was involved in procurement. It was a central bank. It wasn't uh, a military operation, but I ran the foreign exchange desk, a part of the central bank where there were some very large expenditures, very advanced technical, technological um, installations. And so I had to, with every single procurement, work with the lawyer, the attorney who understood contracts, and also um, be sure that I am not getting any personal gain from that. And so if you look at this slide where we have the budget, um, this is a complex slide. I'd like you to spend some time looking at it afterwards, but I want to just ask you, as you go through that, where to think about the fact that the security sector is set within the overall sector of the uh, overall budget cycle, and that at each stage there are important actors. And think about what must be done at each sector, uh, who is there. In the very beginning, you must run the entire budget cycle on the principles of budget management. And one of the first principles is discipline. And discipline in terms of budget means that you have this much money to spend and you don't spend any more. And of course, as Dr. Milante has told us, not only don't you spend any more, but you make sure that you spend it on the items that will give you the most efficient outcome. And I'm reminding you that you must have the most effective outcome, that it has to be spent on what you need to do to achieve the goals of your national security strat strategy. And so, we have that discipline. And then as we move on to the next section of the budget, we ask ourselves, is this a comprehensive budget? Does it include all the activities? And I mean, not just all the expenditures, but all the revenues. And you have the example in securing development where in the Central African Republic, the military was earning millions of dollars from providing security services uh, to diplomats and other activities. They earned this money, but no one knows where it went. It wasn't in the budget. There was no way of assessing if the funds were being 
used well. So everything must be in the budget so that it can be used well, um, so that it's comprehensive. Now, if you look at, there's a table in that book in securing the, the budget, securing development, that will tell you that transparency and accountability, as well as discipline and comprehensiveness are all principles that you have to follow. What I'd like you to do to think about, uh, whether it's in your discussion group or at another time, is as you go through the budget process, which are the principles that are going to guide your act. So that when you go from the budget preparation and resource allocation to the actual procurement, which principles are you keeping in mind when you are procuring the goods? And if you go to the next slide, um, after you've gone through that and you've gone through all your audit and you've gone through your evaluation, of course, you will move to the next cycle. Uh, what I'd like to do is just present the index of governance in the regions. And if you drill down to look at the individual performance, you will see that regions often have common rankings, common ratings. Sometimes it's because of a common experience, political experience, colonial experience. Sometimes it's because a geographic communality gives a, a common exposure to natural risk. But neighborhoods count. The reason that you're going to be discussing the regional organizations next is because those organizations have an enormous potential for helping to build capacity in this area of developing the budget. And what I'd like to do is just take a minute to close and enlisting some of the recommendations from the International Budget Partnership. Now these recommendations were made for Francophone African countries, but they also apply to other parts of Africa. And so I, it's not exactly, it's kind of their recommendations, but my ideas after looking at 50 years of Africa experience. The first thing is respect the budget calendar. Now, you and I know that often we get a document two weeks after it was due, our comments were due. And so we don't have the time to give it the attention and the detail that it should have. Everyone must obey the calendar and work collaboratively with those in other ministries who depend on your input and you who depend on their input. So deliver the information on time so that you can enhance collaboration. And this means also if there's public comment for a document that it should go out to the public in, the, in a timely manner. And related to that, and because you are the emerging leaders, I'm hoping that you will innovate, that you'll use digital systems to support collabor co collaboration and compliance. And I understand that Dr. Melante is developing an app. Okay. So I would hope now that you would also recognize that there are digital applications. In Benin, they've developed an app for the budget where all the calendar is on this app and you can pull out the documents, the budget documents immediately and have access to it so that public comment can be done effectively. 
I would also recommend that you build capacity in parliament and civil society so that they can be effective. Now, sometimes that might be done by having a course in a think tank, or sometimes there might be special training that the military, the police, and other parts of the security sector offer to the parliamentary staff so that they understand what some of these very complex systems mean. But most important, so that they understand what the importance is of training, perhaps most neglected in military uh, and security sector budgeting. But finally, I'd like to say that it's really important to use the regional organizations. I believe you're going to talk about early warning, but I think that the regional organizations can organize meetings among gov governments in the subregion to share ideas on best practice. They can also be used to garner knowledge from think tanks and universities within Africa. At this point, we have several outstanding think tanks, but maybe we need to create a kind of clearinghouse where governments and civil society organizations could just go in and have a one stop to get publications from different organizations. Uh, those are my personal recommendations along with those from the International Budget Partnership. But I hope that those recommendations can be used to tackle what is in fact, you asked for simple facts. I hate to say there is nothing simple about budgeting. These are complex systems. When you change one thing, it has an impact on the other. If you spend on the military, where is that coming from? Is it coming from public health? Then what happens when you have COVID. And that was our case in the United States. Our Center for Disease Control had been receiving lower levels of allocation, while the military, even apart from our conflict situations, was growing. So what I hope is that you'll take in mind that the CIPRI not only gives you the numbers, uh, on military expenditure, but they also had an interesting piece published in the recent weeks that says, if we look at military expenditures, where could we decrease spending to go to other parts of the economy of the government that can help address some of the other security threats that are out there? Because what we're seeing now is that catastrophes, droughts, and others are no longer just catastrophes and droughts. They are actually elements of our world that are leading to conflict. And so if we really want security, we have to look at it within the whole national budget and recognize that collaboration among ministries is the only path to true security. And in Swahili, we say, Harambe, let's all pull together. When we pull together, we achieve success. Thank you. Uh, we are left with uh, roughly about 21 minutes. So what I would like, um, um, uh, just a few points, just I want to make based on uh, Dr. Lane. Uh, one, the document she is referring to is called Securing Development. And this document is one of the references. You can easily access it. I think it is in, uh, in French, English. Is it in Arabic? I don't know, Joel, is in Arabic. Uh, I think Portuguese, no? But it has three languages. So it's accessible, you, you can get it. It's a very important document. Like what uh, Dr. Willin said is just, for the first time, the World Bank started thinking about the security. One of the things that you may find in that document, your country might may be mentioned, but the issue of the budgeting principles, that document showed clearly that these 
the, the, the security sector is not adhering to the issues of the budgeting principles. It's a big issue. Second point that they, they highlighted, and I think I want, I guess, Bill, on what Willin said, the issue of military engaging in business. And what are the side effects? And that's one of the things that you may need to look at. I think it will come up the issue whether should the military be involved in the, uh, in, the, uh, in, the, uh, in the business or not. The other index that I would like you really to highlight is called Ibrahim Index of African Governance. It is IIGA. In that index, it is interactive. You will see clearly what is the perception of the people about the level of safety and security by the country, by the region. Not only that, it will tell you what is the confidence of the citizen of the, of the police and the military. We did some studies, very clear. The people confidence in the military, actually in the police first, and then in the military started declining. So you have a very um, uh, eroding confidence between the citizen and the police and the military. So I think it's a very good uh, uh, index that you can, and you can get your country. I think they started, I think, 2010. And so please look at that one. So now